with Heidi Kotze. Yep. Is that pronounced correctly? That's correct, yes. Okay, and Heidi. Heidi. Heidi, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, Heidi Kotze. From, from South Africa. Originally from South Africa, okay. yes. Uh, currently in Australia. Yeah. And what do you do in Australia then? So I work in the Department of Linguistics at Macquarie University, mm -hmm. um, where I am a senior lecturer mm -hmm. and I teach translation studies. Translation studies well, with any speciality? Well, I mostly take care of translation theory, mm -hmm. um, a bit of research methodology and so on. So okay. unfortunately at the moment I'm not that involved in practical training. Okay, um, but you're doing research. Oh yeah, I'm doing research. Okay. Kind of research. Um, I mostly at the moment focus very strongly on um, corpus yeah. linguistic yeah, research yeah. Um, in translation studies, but actually more generally mm -hmm. as well. So I'm really interested in language variation, mm -hmm. language change, um, varieties of English. Um, as Isn't well. that just linguistics or so social well, linguistics? It or? is. It is, but it's yeah. perhaps a bit more specific than social linguistics okay. more generally. But certainly, it's embedded in that. Okay. How that does paradigm. translation interact with with variation, linguistic ah, variation? Okay. Well, just a short. Well, I, I think that that's. One. I think it's a really important question. Yeah. Actually, um, so one of the things that's become really clear to me over the last couple of years, at least to me, is that. Translation studies has a lot in common, in fact, with um, with variations linguistics, um, in trying to understand um, the factors that shape different kinds of language production. Mm -hmm. um, so, in translation studies, we're often interested in understanding what it is that makes translation as a kind of variety of language, mm -hmm, yeah. um, what makes it similar to other kinds of varieties or different from other kinds of varieties. Um, and we think, of course, that there are very many factors that Im impact that, and some of these factors are cognitive and some of them are social. Um, and what sort of increasingly struck me is that there is a lot of commonality in how we in translation studies can think about these factors that shape linguistic production and translation. Mm -hmm. Um, and how people in um, variationist linguistics or in um, linguistics more generally um, try to investigate how cognitive and social factors um, impact language production as such. Sure. Right. And what's really interesting is if you then start to try and model how these factors are the same or different for translation versus other kinds of varieties. Right? Yeah. So you could look at monolingual language production, written production, or you could go to spoken language if you're interested in interpreting. Um, but you could also look at, for example, bilingualism influenced communication. So um, the language production by bilinguals, proficient bilinguals, or by learners of a language, and sort of look at how the constraints, if you like, that affect these different kinds of language production are similar or different. And I think that tells us really interesting things about what's happening in translation okay. and how that's very often the same. But this is bringing methodologies across from yeah. social linguistics of variation, that's the tradition of, of Labov. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. It was an obvious thing to do, but nobody did it. Is that... Well, I, I think so. Yeah, um, I think yeah. there is increasing interest in that. And, yeah. I, and there are people who have been working in that area for a while, mm -hmm. but certainly I find it curious okay. that it's not more commonly used in, in translation okay. studies. Yeah. Let's go back to your mid twenties. Yes. If we can. <laughs> That's not very long ago. <laughs> well, longer than you think. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what were you doing? Twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, something like that. So in my mid twenties, um, I was I just basically finished doing a master's degree here mm -hmm. in South Africa mm -hmm. um, at the Northwest University yes. and my master's degree in fact has nothing whatsoever to do with translation so um, my master's degree is in English literature okay um, and just but your first language yes. is, is Afrikaans yes, yes okay is. Um, yeah. so my master's degree is on modernist and postmodernist poetry mm -hmm. in fact um, and then shortly after finishing my master's degree, I actually left academia 
um, and I went to work in educational publishing. So mm-hmm. I worked for Macmillan Publishers. Okay. Um, in and their focus is on producing learning materials and school okay. books. So not translating or anything like that. Well, okay. I I did do a bit of translation at that point, but mostly I I did. Um, Ed- editing work yeah, as well as yeah. um, materials development. Yeah. So school books for for South Africa, Botswana, Swaziland. Yeah. That was a major shift mm-hmm. in terms of you know my own um, focus and my understanding of mm. of language. Sort of going from this you know quite um, almost esoteric um, area of you know postmodernism yeah. and poetry to the realities of how do you make good books. For kids sure. um, in South Africa, How? and that's where I ran into, you know, my first encounters with translation and editing, and my interest in language mediation comes okay. from there, I think. So translation was an extension of that. Translation yeah. was an extension of that, mm-hmm. um, certainly. But I mean, I I did a, a BA degree and an honors degree, and there was no real um, translation studies in that. It was mm-hmm. sort of tangential yeah. in a way. So um, what did you do then? You you you. You did a PhD yeah, I did. in so South Africa again. I did. Yes, so yeah. I, I returned, when I returned to academia, in a way, I think I was trying to get uh, or to connect my kind of literary background um, with these realities um, of how translation and editing function in a multilingual mm-hmm. context yeah. to produce books for kids. Um, and so I, I did a PhD, indeed, at the University of the mm-hmm. um, which was all about um, the role of translation in the production um, and reception of children's books. Yeah. In, in some so that way. PhD and became your book with did, Benjamins. Yes. It did, yeah. That won the European, yes. whatever it is, Translation Society's Young, Young Scholar, Scholar Prize, because yes. I gave you the prize. That's I remember. right, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and published an ex- excellent piece of research. Thank you. So, so you've moved on from there, or you? Yeah. Um, so it, it's really interesting to reflect on this um, mm. because I think already while I was busy with that PhD work, um, I was kind of becoming a bit frustrated with the methods that I felt I had at my disposal. So that book was very much focused on um, it had analysis of publishing data, um, but it also had textual analysis. Yes, it had and lots of different methodologies. It had lots of different yes. methodologies and in a way I think that sort of reflects me trying to grapple with you know what methods mm-hmm. are available to answer the questions that I'm interested in. Um, and I think that sort of started a trajectory for me where I was really thinking very carefully about what methods I felt uh, could give me um, answers to the questions Good. that I was interested in. And so I, I started moving into doing a bit of experimental work okay. with eye tracking and key yeah. logging, started moving into corpus linguistics at that point as well. Yeah. Um, and I've increasingly moved in that direction. I would say. Is, is corpus work um, a tool or is it a yes. bigger than that, an approach? Uh, to, to, I mean, That's an interesting question. So it is in the first instance a tool. And it can be used for lots of different um, things. And I think it's unfortunate that it has had a bit of a reputation of being very much focused on linguistic questions only. um, Because it's really adaptable to other kinds of research questions as well. Um, And I I think we're starting to see a lot of... We're starting to see more of that kind of work. Oh, that's what I about. like about your work. You Don't forget there are humans in it oh, somewhere. Oh, absolutely, you know? absolutely. And the corpus bit yeah. did, I think... Well, to some degree, I think that's true. Um, But there is certainly a... um, There are assumptions that underlie corpus work, and that is the assumption that we... that language is something that exists in the world out there. It it only exists as it is used in communication between people. Mm -hmm. So corpus work relies on that Mm -hmm. um, idea, and, of course, that is... um, is not always was not always the dominant idea in linguistics sure. more generally where you you know for a long time had um, the ideas of Chomsky and the mentalist views dominate. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- there are certain assumptions behind corpus methods, but I think ultimately it's a method that's really flexible for lots of different questions. Sure. Mm-hmm. What kind of research would you like to see people do? 
Uh, not necessarily is, yours, but what, what kind of stuff do you think we need? I think, I would, I think we need to see research that is, more research that is more methodologically aware, linking translation studies. Mm -hmm. I think that is certainly changing, but it's also mm -hmm. challenging because translation studies are such a diverse discipline. What do you mean by, can you give an example of methodologically, methodologically aware? aware? Well, yes. I think, um, uh, so one of the other things that I do um, is I'm the co-editor of Target. Yes, oh right, I forgot, yes, you're the most no. powerful person in, <laughs> no, in translation no, studies. No, well. No, <laughs> um, so that has been, and I've only been doing that for a relatively short time, um, but one of the things that, that comes up a lot in the papers that we receive is um, there is a, a sense that the person wants to investigate a particular question and then sort of just go straight into analysing whatever it is that they are interested in doing. So, you know, whether it's textual analysis or, or interviews or whatever, but there's an intermediate step often that's missing, which is a quite conscious reflection about what are the questions that I want to answer and what are the best methods to mm -hmm. answer these questions and a description of those methods as well, which yeah. would make it possible for other people to do similar things to what you're a doing. Replication. Well, replication, yeah. I mean, replication is relevant not to all kinds of research in translation mm -hmm. studies, but certainly thinking about the implications of the method that you choose. Yeah. Um, you but know, does this mean going beyond descriptive translation studies? I mean, that. How do you mean? Well, we're getting into your asked, what will descriptive translation studies give us beyond isolated descriptions. Oh, yes, okay. It's sort of an invitation to serious thought about methodology, I thought. I, I agree with uh, that. Yeah. Um, and I think it raises questions about, well, what is it that you want to accomplish in a particular study? So yeah. if you wish to, um, if you want to focus on one particular instance of a translational phenomenon and analyze that, that's one thing. Yeah. But if you're interested in going beyond that into finding some kind of generalities, yeah. um, that's where the methodological questions become, you know, more pressing in a way. They're always there, um, but the moment I think that you want to move to generalization, those methodological questions um, become crucial. Um, okay. I think that. Translation is, I, I, nobody would disagree that translation is a really complex phenomenon. There are all these complex and social factors mm. in the keynote that we heard this morning, the sort of really getting into that complexity. Um, and I would, I would really like to see more research that engages conceptually, but also methodologically with the complexity mm -hmm. of those um, cognitive and social factors. And I, I also think it's not uh, a sustainable dichotomy, even which, to think of dichotomy? cognitive and social, sure, because these yeah, things yeah, are connected. But that. how do you how do you investigate that? And I think does complexity solve a problem? Do you mean complexity as in as the in complexity theory? Complexity theory, yeah. I think it. I think it gives some interesting things to think yes, about. Absolutely. But I also sometimes wonder. Um, to what degree it is not um, connecting with similar ideas that have been around within translation studies for a long time, sure, um, yeah, and just yeah. giving it a different kind of a different kind of an angle. I mean, just this morning in the keynote talk, uh, the idea of constraints. Yes, that was an article in Meta years ago. Exactly, but, uh, and yes. it's something that in in the more linguistics, linguistically oriented areas in translation studies, something that we're working on sure. is sort of how to model the different constraints. Mm. But we're talking about, you know, statistically modeling different constraints that affect linguistic sure. choices. And so it seems to me really interesting that there are these similar concepts floating around, and I wonder you know, how much of it is reinventing the wheel sometimes? Uh, well, it's hard to know it is everything know. that is being and has been done. I exactly, think, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think it definitely raises some interesting questions sure. to think about. So that's the one thing okay, that I good. Like to Let's go to other, other stuff. The other thing is um, more true interdisciplinary research, yeah. and I think uh, more careful interdisciplinary research as well. Mm. Um, 
I think that it's it's quite easy to take over concepts from other areas um, of research without really understanding the embeddedness of those concepts in their own discourses. Yep. So I think interdisciplinarity is very important, but um, in practice, very difficult to do well. You know how hard it is to publish on translation outside of translation studies? Yeah, no. you know, we're sort of easy coming in, but going out Exactly. Is, you know. So um, in some of the work that I've been doing, I've been trying to do that. Mm. So uh, looking at the idea of language contact mm. as a unifying concept mm. and saying, well, translation is one form of lang language contact, yep. but let's compare it with other kinds yes, of language absolutely. contact. Yes, absolutely. Obvious thing to and, do. Um, there is some, I mean, I think there is some interest in that in areas outside of yeah. translation studies, but you're quite right. It is difficult to, for that interdisciplinarity to go both ways. Well, I, what we f I find personally that is in uh, language learning, language acquisition, and in social linguistics, there's a very simplified notion of translation. Oh, absolutely. And it's very hard to get over that. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah, definitely. The last thing I'd like Good. to say is um, I would like to see, personally, more conversation between translation studies and contemporary areas of linguistics. Um, <sighs> Yep. <laughs> it went out of fashion, eh? It, I, well, it's, I think it has in a way, and I yeah, think yeah. there are obvious reasons why that's happened mm. in the discipline. Um, but I, I think it's really unfortunate that there's been a bit of a break. So that's with, in your case, the social linguistics of variation. Absolutely. Are there other parts that we should be looking at? Oh, well, I think there are certainly people who have been doing this for quite some time. So, you know, I think of Sandra Halverson's work in cognitive sure. linguistics as well. But, you know, if you look at contemporary areas in linguistics, there are really exciting areas like cognitive social linguistics, which mm. tries to meld cognitive linguistics and social linguistics, mm. which seems to me exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to do in translation as well, yeah. by looking at cognitive and social factors. Um, so I think there are lots of areas. I mean, discourse analysis is another area that's been really been, sure. you know, had a a fairly continuous representation. In the Australian this. context, I find that discourse on translation is welded in, is, is, is with discourse analysis, Absolutely. pragmatics. Absolutely. Also systemic uh, functional linguistics and so on. Because of yeah. Macquarie. He went well, Macquarie. yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it does mean, um, you know, that it's sometimes uh, difficult to make connections with other areas. So the other area of linguistics that I think it would be really productive for translation studies to look at is construction grammar. Um, so there are all these possibilities. Okay, so there's a lot of work to do. Well, I, I think... Or know, look at, I mean... A lot, yeah. of, a lot of interesting possibilities, sure. and I think having those connection points between translation studies and, and linguistics is important as okay. well. Speaking of connection points, you're yes. moving to the Netherlands. That is, is that right. Yes. So I'm. Um, you sort of catch me almost between jobs yeah. at the moment. Okay. Um, from the first of November, I will move um, to Utrecht University, mm -hmm. where I'll be professor and chair of translation studies. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I'm okay. looking forward to it. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, okay. Andrew.